Well, I'm going to talk through practical considerations for natural serviceable management today. And I want to emphasize this is intended to be very practical. I'm not going to share a lot of peer reviewed data on bull development and, and um, longevity of bulls as a function of how they were developed or anything like that. Uh, my goal is just if you bought a bull or you're planning to buy a bull this bull season, what does the management of that bull look like when you actually uh, bring him home? So I want to start here. Is it really so hard to be a bull? I think often we we um, kick bulls out to pasture and we think, well, they don't have to raise a calf. They don't have to do all these other things that the, the cow herd has to do. They ought to be a pretty low maintenance individual. And I actually think it can be pretty hard to be a bull. And so I want to walk through where my where my thoughts are at as I think about some of these considerations first. Um, number one is we should take a step back and realize what we have done as an industry over the past 50 years. We have moved largely in this direction of younger ages at first breeding for bulls. Historically, much of the cattle industry would have used a um, what I would call a coming two-year-old type of model for bulls, where bulls were developed fairly slowly and were often exposed to females at around two years of age or close to two years of age. And we've moved away from that and, and moved towards younger ages. Um, so of course, the obviously, as we think about very young ages, we're thinking about yearling bulls. So I would tend to define those as exposed to females for the first time somewhere in that 14 to 17 months of age range. You may also see some bulls marketed with the phrasing of age advantage. That could mean all sorts of things, depending on what that marketer is, is talking about. But that might mean something like an 18-month-old bull, for example, a bull out of a fall type of program that ends up going into a spring type of program or, or spring to fall and has that extra age advantage prior to his first exposure to, to females. Or you might, again, see uh, more of the coming two-year-old type of model still in place as well. Um, we could talk about the pros and cons of both of those, and, and I'll, I'll give you some thoughts on those, but I think those, those differences in age at first breeding really need um, or really require us then to think about some of our big picture management system questions in terms of what we're going to actually expect those bulls to do. So what was the development program prior to the purchase of that bull? How was he developed? And, and what is that that nutrition going to be like for that bull as he's then brought onto the farm. So with yearling bulls, and, and this is almost going to seem like I'm picking on yearling bulls or on seed stock producers that market yearling bulls. I'm not at all. Much of the industry does that in many, in many respects, that is, that is kind of the norm or has become the norm. But I think we just need to be aware of the challenges that that does create for us, uh, in addition to, of course, the opportunity. So, of course, from an opportunity standpoint, you know, use of younger bulls is an opportunity to potentially hasten genetic progress in the seed stock industry, turn over that generation interval more rapidly. Seed stock producers also really like to market yearling bulls as opposed to carrying them longer, because even though they do have maybe more... Um, more feed costs associated with those bulls. They don't have the time on feed associated with those bulls. And often the overall cost is actually lower to, to produce yearling bulls than it is older bulls. And there's also less time in that development program for those bulls to have injuries or disease or mortality or fall out of that, um, that seed stock producers program. So there are several advantages and several reasons why yearling bulls um, are popular. That said, they, they do have cons, right? They do have challenges. And, and one challenge of yearling bull um, programs is that those bulls have to be pushed somewhat nutritionally to develop in, in that manner by that age. And so a concern that we often have is um, our seed stock producers actually over conditioning bulls. We know that if we have excessive fat deposition in the scrotum, that that can reduce fertility. And, and the reason that happens is the um, there's a vasculature exchange mechanism in those testicles where essentially arteries flowing into the testicles and veins flowing out of the testicles kind of spiral around each other and are interwoven so that the arterial blood can cool down. And that's really important for the ability of that bull to maintain his testicles at a or at a lower temperature than the rest of his body. That's really important for um, sperm cell development. And if we 
fat is a very effective insulator, right? That's what it does biologically. If we put a bunch of fat around that vasculature, uh, we compromise the ability of that bull to really thermoregulate his testes appropriately. So we worry about that. We worry about that in yearling bull programs in particular, where bulls are pushed a lot because some of that push ends up going to condition. And depending on the, the, the concentrate content of the diet or the type of ration that those bulls are on, that can also potentially be a, a challenge. We know that excessive concentrate content can, can cause some poor structural, um, you know, poor structure issues in those bulls. So those are concerns. The one I want to focus on today, though, is really less about the bull development program. And it's this fact, which is that young bulls that have been pushed and are turned out as yearling bulls, often, from my own experience in commercial settings, uh, struggle to maintain condition uh, when turned out to pasture conditions. And so the bottom line is, if you're going to use yearling bulls, because admittedly they do offer some opportunities, just be honest about what those challenges are and, and let's figure out some ways to manage around those. And often that's going to mean that these young bulls really require a bit more attentive management, both during and, and after their first breeding season. So let's talk about the during part first and talk about the challenges faced in the breeding season. Um, if you have heard me talk before, you know that every time I say spring calving, I, I normally use air quotes because spring calving in Missouri uh, is often referring to the breeding season happening in the spring. And if the breeding season is happening in the spring, the calving season is happening in the winter, right? January and February are not the spring in Missouri. Now, now there's arguably lots of good reasons to do this. And I understand all of those reasons, but like the yearling bull example that we just talked about, that comes with some challenges and we're never gonna fix those challenges if we pretend they don't exist. So let's be honest about what those challenges are. And here's what I, th I think the big one is. If we look at cow requirements post calving, and, and this is lining up the, the, uh, the metabolizable energy requirements of that cow, um, based on her stage of production and assuming um, that she calves here around February 1, if you look at what happens, that requirements of that animal as she begins to lactate um, increase dramatically. And yet we know that our cool season agronomic forages that we have in the, in the state of Missouri, uh, predominantly fescue, but also things like orchard grass and timothy and these other components of the cool season system, really we don't get a lot of vegetative yield at that time. And so we have to fill this gap if we put cows in, in that gap. I say this to talk about cows, but remember if you're turning a yearling bull out to pasture with cows, um, you're putting that bull through the same situation that you're putting the cows through. Now, that bull doesn't have uh, requirements associated with lactation, but he has requirements associated with growth. This is a growing animal that has, you know, previous to this point been pushed. And so we're going to ask him to go through some, some challenging situations. And here's what that looks like, uh, at least from my perspective. Breeding is taking place often in our spring calving systems in this transition period where cows are moving off, in many cases, some sort of hay and, and supplementation type of ration or some other type of winter feeding strategy onto green grazing forage. And we often see that taking place maybe a bit too aggressively in Missouri, uh, where folks turn cattle out to pasture when it is too lush and what we call washy. And when I say washy, I'm talking about forage that is really high in its moisture content and its protein content, um, but not terribly high in its energy content. And because of the high passage rate of that really high moisture, high protein forage through the animal, you will actually see cows struggle to physically uh, maintain fill and get the energy requirements that they need on that really washy um, forage. So as a result of that, we often actually do send cows a little bit backwards, especially in these quote unquote spring calving seasons, which are really winter calving seasons, if we turn cows out uh, too early. And so allowing grazing too early is really bad for a number of reasons. One is that animal performance piece, and that's going to be both the, the female and the male, right? But the other piece is that we impair total forage production for the year when we go in and we nip that, you know, very first solar panel that that grass makes off and we really compromise its ability to, uh, to produce for the entire year. So just be very mindful of timing of turnout onto spring forage if you're doing a, a winter calving model. Now, if you're calving in the actual spring, which I, I know very few Missouri producers that do that, but if you are calving in the actual uh, true spring, 
Um, so let's say, you know, mid, mid to late March um, and, and moving forward, that sets you up really with, with not many of those concerns because that transition to green forage happens around the time of calving. Um, but it does set you up for a big challenge for the summer breeding season because you will be breeding cows in the true summer or, or maybe the better way to say it is you will be attempting to breed cows in the true summer and that is that is challenging so we're not only talking about heat stress and potential effects of fescue toxicosis during the breeding season and we know that fescue can have some negative effects on reproduction specifically um, that becomes even more of a consideration if you have some cattle that are not terribly well adapted to this environment. Most of this state's cow herd is Angus based. Angus cattle are British cattle. Uh, Great Britain doesn't have summer months like we have. And so just remember that historically, these are not breeds that are very well adapted to this environment. Our major breeds that we use in the beef industry are not typically adapted to heat stress and, and toxic fescue and things like that. Are there little adapted strains? I'm sure there are, but, but just bear that in mind as you think about um, trying to breed in the summer months and, and what that would look like if you're really intent on having that kind of system, how that should influence some of your genetic considerations. Beside, that's a little bit outside of the point of what I wanna talk about today, but also bear in mind if you are breeding in the true summer um, and you have predominantly a cool season forage base, even if that's not fescue, cool season forages are not going to maintain that, that growth um, and productivity in the summer months. And so we're going to send cattle into a summer slump in terms of forage availability and also potentially forage quality. You know, if you allow those forages to go reproductive, form seed heads, rather than maintaining them in a vegetative state uh, in particular, that's going to, to really um, do a number on forage quality. So be thinking about all those considerations as if this is really the kind of system that you want to have because those apply not only to cattle uh, excuse me not only to cows but really to all cattle including bulls that we're putting into that system now for fall breeding seasons um, that often also involves a change in diet quality right around the time of the breeding season so without good grazing management if you're not stockpiling forage for for winter grazing for example as we would typically encourage you to to do the forage quality on offer is typically going to be declining over the course of a fall breeding season. So what I often see in sort of a typical kind of what I joke is D minus grazing management that, that we get in the state of Missouri often, I, I see folks grazing pastures into the ground uh, going into the fall breeding season. And that is really how you screw up reproductive performance in fall, fall pairs. I'll just tell you um, that, that, that that's really asking too much from those females. So if that transition from um, grazing to a hay type of hay and supplement type of ration is happening right around the time of the breeding season, just also recognize that that can be problematic in and of itself, that switch. And so I, I, I'm really an advocate for stockpiling forage for winter grazing to get you through as much of that breeding season as possible in a fall system. I think that's that's one of the best things you can can do for a number of reasons. If you look at the forage quality of the stockpiled tall fescue, for example. The other thing to bear in mind is what your grazing management really ought to look like during a fall breeding season. Um, because even if you are doing some well-managed grazing, like some, some strip grazing, for example, of stockpiled tall fescue, we know that the alkaloids in tall fescue are concentrated in the crown of the plant and the lower portion of the plant um, in, that, in the fall. And, and so if we graze very closely, um, there's been a lot of good data generated at MU and in other locations as well, that, uh, that we, if we graze too closely, we, we really could pose some problems for cattle based on the alkaloids uh, that they consume as we ask them to graze that close. So leave adequate residual when strip grazing um, and rotate cattle to different pastures or move to a sacrifice area rather than just overgrazing into the crown portions of the stand. So my bottom line for breeding seasons, I realize this has been a little bit about general management of cattle, but remember we're during the course of the breeding season, those bulls are with the cows, right? So we're really managing the whole group. Typically unlikely that we're going out and supplementing the bulls specifically, although I realize some producers will attempt to do that, but especially yearling bulls are likely to lose condition over the course of the breeding season. That's just a fact of life. And so we're trying to manage that decline and mitigate that. And, and part of how we do that is ensuring adequate body condition of bulls prior to turnout. 
So a good target is a body condition score of six for bulls. And that's a modest amount of fat cover. Um, you know, you could, you could be at five and a half, you could be at six and a half, but really that target of six is a, a wise place to be. We don't want to send them in with extremely excessive condition. Don't over condition the bulls for the reasons we've talked about previously. But if we're turning bulls into cows for a breeding season at, at a body condition score of five, even though that bull looks good today, just remember that he's going to lose condition over the course of that breeding season. And we really need to send him in with some, some energy reserves. The other thing to consider is the number of females that we expect that bull to cover. So the more females that you expect that bull to cover, the more work you're giving him to do. Um, and, and so just be mindful of that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I do think managed grazing is a great strategy to mitigate that, that loss in condition. If you look at, again, the feed value of stockpiled forages, and you can, um, you can go and, and watch a previous YouTube recording of um, you know, talks that have been given as part of the Forage Livestock Town Hall series. Um, stockpiled tall fescue is an amazing resource for winter months uh, in particular, as you think about uh, fall breeding seasons. Also consider the length of the breeding season. And, and I really wanna put an emphasis on that. Um, I'm a, a huge advocate for managing for short calving seasons. And I, I've always said that you can do that in one of two ways. One is to have a very short breeding season. Um, and then the other way is to have a very long breeding season or really a breeding season of any length, but have pregnancy diagnosis performed and market bred cows that conceived to calve outside of your desired length calving season. Typically, I recommend that second option because in most cases, that's economically advantageous because you get to market bred cows rather than open cows. However, if you're going to use yearling bulls, just be, be mindful of the fact that you're going to ask those bulls to work over the course of that breeding season. And if you are, are going to expose yearling bulls for, for, let's say, a 90 plus day long breeding season, they could really slip quite a bit in condition. And so you really need to be mindful of what you're asking them to do, how many cows you're, how many females you're asking them to cover and, uh, and, and so on and so forth, how they start off that breeding season in terms of condition. So in ensuring that, uh, that post-breeding management of, of those animals is also appropriate to restore their condition is important as well. And I'm not gonna go through the data, but there is some data that suggests that if we compromise uh, the, the condition of bulls too extremely, and then we, you know, we take too long to get that back on, that we could actually have some lifelong effects on the fertility of bulls. So we do want to manage how much condition they lose, and we want to get that condition back on them after the breeding season. So we really need to think about not just during the breeding season, but also what we do in the off season. So what do we do in the off season? So often um, I see bulls in Missouri put into, into um, lots, if you're going to put bulls into lots, into just essentially a sacrifice area or sacrifice lot, force some exercise for those bulls, especially as you get closer to the next breeding season. You know, yes, we do need to put condition back on those bulls, but we also need to maintain, you know, uh, appropriate um, skeletal muscular function, skeletal muscular function. And we need to keep those bulls in shape. And so a good way to do that is to place mineral feeders and water and feed bunks and, and any other things that you might have as features in that pasture in kind of far portions of that pen and, and actually force those bulls to walk back and forth um, to encourage their activity. So here's an example of that, you know, this just kind of triangular arrangement where those bulls actually have to walk a fair bit uh, to get back and forth between those things that they, they use. That said, just because bulls need to be in a separate area from cows doesn't always mean that they need to be in a sacrifice area or a dry lot. So I would consider even a very simple, you know, very easy to manage grazing design for your bulls. It doesn't have to be an elaborate system. It doesn't have to be daily moves. It doesn't have to be anything terribly fancy. But if you can design something simple, you know, with um, some, some poly wire that you put up um, at the start of that season or, or, you know, very simple interior divisions and actually um, do a little bit of managed grazing for bulls, something simple, um, I think is a, is a strong move. If you are supplementing bulls in a dry lot or in a continuously grazed pasture where they have access to that entire pasture all the time, 
Um, I would encourage you to use feed bunks rather than ground feeding whatever supplement you're going to provide just to reduce some fecal oral disease transmission. If, if you're on supplementing in a managed grazing situation and there's adequate reco recovery time between grazing events, I, I'm a little less concerned about ground feeding, but in general would encourage you to use feed bunks for bulls. Uh, I realize that they may, they may tear them up, I understand, but uh, I would encourage you to do that if you have bulls in sacrifice areas or in dry lots. Summer is a concern for all cattle, um, but, but really our, our breeding animals, um, we need to be thinking about what heat stress can do to sperm cell function. And, and you, know, you have to remember that what happens to a bull today shows up as poor semen quality about two months from now. That's about the length of spermatogenesis in bulls. So the insult that we give a bull shows up about two months later. That's an important consideration for a couple reasons. One is, you know, if, let's say we are asking bulls to do a little bit of breeding in the summer months. Uh, they're going to get away with that for a little bit of the summer. But as the summer wears on, um, that's when those really fertility can drop off. And there are instances in the literature where bulls completely shut down in terms of their fertility as a function of heat stress. So extreme things can happen and we need to be mindful of that. In terms of mitigating heat stress in general, water access is the single most important thing that we need to have for, for all livestock as a means of mitigating heat stress. So access to water within a reasonable distance and access to water that's reasonably palatable that those animals will actually drink it. That's, that's our major tool to mitigate heat stress. Often we think that our major tool is shade and frankly, it's not. Okay, shade is, shade is beneficial. Um, it, there, there have been studies showing that shade is beneficial in some cases, but shade also comes with its own challenges. And so if you're using shade structures and things like that, um, you have to be aware that those can also become loafing areas. And sometimes they just become messy, you know, manure and urine filled pits that, that really are, are very problematic. Um, so my, my general recommendation is, you know, if you have a way to move bulls, um, rotationally, just like we would move cows or if they're, if they're with cows in rotational grazing systems, you know, resting pastures and having natural shade sources that uh, don't receive a lot of continuous animal impact um, is, is always a good move as you think about shade. The other thing I would encourage you to remember is that um, fescue-based pastures, you know, that the, the go to seed especially um, it present a big problem with fescue toxicosis and fescue toxicosis compounds heat stress. Okay, they're two different things, but fescue toxicosis uh, compounds heat stress. And so be mindful of that. The other things to think about in terms of off-season bull management or parasite control, both internal and external. Often we're going to put bulls through a fairly stressful period over the course of the breeding season. And you may want to think about at, talking to your veterinarian about, you know, should you actually deworm bulls after the breeding season based on what they may have picked up on pasture or, you know, especially as a result of being stressed, um, are, are they a little more susceptible to internal parasites? So I, I would just encourage you to consult with your veterinarian about your general overall vaccination program for bulls and parasite control, both internal and external. Will the nutrition on offer, will, again, will the nutrition on offer to the bull in the off season restore body condition to the appropriate level after that breeding season has ended? If you're going to use bulls in both spring and fall breeding seasons, you really need to think through that because often, um, particularly if you use a longer breeding season in the spring and then turn right back around him and use that, uh, that bull again in, in the fall, that's not a lot of recovery time, and especially for young bulls or bulls that have slipped a bit in condition, uh, it may require some pretty intentional management to bring him back up to appropriate condition before the start of that next breeding season. So just be mindful of that. Reach out to your livestock specialist in your region if you want to think through some, some bull ration considerations if you are going to do something like that. And then since we are just coming out of the winter months, I always like to remember or always like to remind folks that we, we need to manage bulls in the winter to avoid scrotal frostbite. Um, you know, cattle have this tendency to, um, to face away from uh, the wind and often that leaves the scrotum of that bull pretty susceptible uh, to, to extreme cold wind. And so windbreaks are helpful for cattle and, and that doesn't have to be a fancy windbreak structure. That just may mean thinking about what pastures and what geographic features you have in that pasture that can can block some wind. You'll see animals use those in extreme wind situations. 
Uh, and then, of course, if you are using dry lots or sacrifice areas, it break that contact with bare ground. Frozen ground, um, it, it, as you notice bulls laying, they'll often have scrotal contact with the ground surface. And so bare ground is a problem when we get into cold weather. So break that up with some kind of bedding that could be straw bales, that could be corn stalks or something like that. But breaking that up with some kind of bedding is, is important. And then I'm going to wrap up with some general bull considerations. Um, some of those are found in this manual. This is a um, extension manual that's 30 some publications that uh, I, I help organize and, and try to maintain now on a yearly basis. It's a, it's a new publication, but there is a fair bit in here on bulls. One is this publication on the left of reproductive anatomy and physiology of the bull. Of course, I didn't have time to go through that today, but if you want to think through um, any of the considerations that have been talked about in terms of what, what is the actual anatomy and physiology going on there, that is in that extension publication. Then on this right side, um, there's a publication on determining reproductive fertility in herd bulls. And that talks a lot about bull breeding soundness exams. And bull breeding soundness exams are an evaluation of a bull's suitability for a breeding program. Excuse me, a bull's suitability for a breeding program and a, a veterinarian uh, would conduct that for you. And they would either score that bull as satisfactory, unsatisfactory, or potentially deferred, which may mean that that bull really ought to probably be reevaluated at a later date. Now, that the bull breeding soundness exam, colloquially, you might hear people say that we're semen checking bulls or something like that. It is an evaluation of semen uh, quality, but it's also an evaluation of the overall status of the bull. So, what is his scrotal circumference? Um, th there's typically a palpation of, of several. Uh, parts of the reproductive tract to ensure that everything is healthy and, and we don't have some abnormalities there or some disease present. Um, also an evaluation of the general structural soundness. Is that bull lame? Uh, does that bull have some, some long toes, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's an evaluation of, of overall health as well. So that's an important component of a bull breeding soundness exam. You might be surprised um, what a veterinarian notices that, that maybe you didn't notice. So I would encourage you to... Um, to, to think through the opportunities associated with this. Now, this does not tell you whether that bull will actually go serve as cows. It doesn't look at the bull's libido. It doesn't look at his dominance within the group. It doesn't do any of that. We really can't do that all that effectively. And so that's not part of a breeding soundness exam, but this is an insurance policy that helps you to catch bulls that clearly wouldn't work. And I, I have a very strong suggestion that you do a bull breeding soundness exam for every breeding season for every bull that will be turned out. They're not terribly expensive. And if you think about um, just the, the revenue that is on the line of actually getting cows bred and getting those calves on the ground, that's a big deal. Um, so I think it's a very inexpensive investment. If you go to my YouTube channel, which is the Mizzou Repro page on YouTube, uh, and it's on Facebook as well. There's a video on bull breeding soundness exams. And we worked with a couple of veterinarians at the Parish Veterinary Clinic in, in Paris, Missouri to put that together. It's a really good video. Um, and, and I would encourage you to check that out. It gives you a nice overview of the process. And if you have, uh, have never had a, a bull breeding soundness exam performed on a bull, um, I, I, I would hope that you'll watch this and go, hey, I need to do that um, this, this season because it, it does take out some of the variability uh, potentially. I'll wrap up with, with a few thoughts about how many cows can a bull actually cover. We often talk about that as a bull to cow ratio. So the first thing I wanna say is the serving capacity of individual bulls is highly variable from bull to bull, and it's affected by a lot of factors. One is the age of the bull. Uh, one is the libido of the bull. And then pre-weaning nutrition. What was that development program like for that bull that bull, excuse me, prior to weaning, what was the development like um, after weaning? It's affected by a lot of things. And, and the number of calves that actually get produced by individual bulls in multi-sire breeding pastures is amazingly variable. In terms of the, the literature looking at that, it is amazing how prolific some individual bulls are in multi-sire breeding pastures and, and how much of a dud other bulls are. That's also affected by age and libido and, and serving capacity. Uh, it's also affected by fertility, and it's also affect, affected by this dominance hierarchy uh, within the group. So as we think about bull to cow recommendations, um, sometimes I, I see articles where, where people almost joke that extension is, is way too conservative. 
um, in their bull to cow ratios. And, and I always just want to say, well, of course we are, because our job is to be a little bit conservative and to give some conservative rules of thumb. And they are just rules of thumb because we know how variable bulls are. So some of the common rules of thumb that you'll see from extension are that yearling bulls not be expected to service more than say 15 to 20 females. Um, so you may have heard the rule of thumb that about uh, one female per every month and age of the bull. That's just kind of a, a rule of thumb. Age advantage bulls, so those bulls that are in that, you know, 18 to 24 month range, you know, 18 to 25 females is, is probably an appropriate rule of thumb. Mature bulls, we don't really know the top end for mature bulls because of how variable they are, uh, but there are some studies where ratios of one to 60 have been used very effectively. So you'll often see recommendations that are somewhat conservative from extension of one to 25 or one to 30 or something like that and know that that is conservative. Um, but, but, but there you go. So what about if you're using an estrus synchronization protocol prior to natural service, then I get very conservative because we're going to have a synchronized period of estrus expression. And we're going to ask a lot out of those bulls in a, in a short period of time. So err on the conservative end of that conservative bull to cow ratio. So for example, um, you know, in say a mature bull one to 25, I feel a lot more comfortable about than one to 60. If I'm going to use natural service after an estrus synchronization protocol. The other thing I would encourage you to do is avoid use of inexperienced bulls in synchronized breeding systems, if at all possible. So you're going to ask females to come and heat in a short period of time with synchronization. And unless that group is a pretty small group, that could mean we have a lot of females in heat in a very short amount of time. And then this young inexperienced bull is expected is expected to uh, figure it out um, for that many females. That's actually asking a fair bit of that bull. Um, so consider multi-sire rather than single sire breeding pastures um, as well, uh, especially if you're using um, synchronization and natural service. It just takes some of the um, considerations out of that. This is another publication that's available through ME Extension. It's part of that manual I, I mentioned on protocols for synchronization if you're using some natural service. I'm not going to go through this today, but there's a lot in here in terms of some helpful advice and some synchronization protocols that might make sense for your system. Um, if, if you're thinking about single sire versus multi sire breeding pastures, um, just to wrap up with a couple thoughts on that. Um, in a single sire situation, all of our eggs are in one basket, right? Or all of our sperm cells are in one scrotum, right? So, so we do have some, um, we do have some higher risk in any single sire. Um, situation in terms of will we actually have cows bred? You know, if we have a dud bull in that group, then that's a dud group of cows for that breeding season, right? Um, that said, there's less risk of bull injury in single sire pastures for sure. So that's a consideration. Um, multi sire pastures, we have less control over the matings. We, we don't have calves that are sire identified. And of course, we could do some parentage testing and take care of that issue. But, but that's, um, th those are the pros and cons of each of those systems. Just another practical tip would be group bulls together in the off season as they will be turned out together in the breeding season. So we have dominance hierarchies in groups of bulls. And when we turn bulls out that have not previously been together, we're asking for trouble. And also if we maybe had a large group of bulls and then we start whittling them down into small groups of bulls to turn out, uh, we're sort of resetting that hierarchy. And so just expect to see some, some fighting. You're still going to observe some fighting in most multi-sire breeding pastures um, in the early portions of the breeding season. So don't be terribly alarmed by that, um, but, but do try to minimize it with just how you um, group those bulls. And then I also just reminder, yearling bulls mixed with mature bulls, now we've got a real problem, right? Because we've got a, a large mature animal uh, that's capable potentially of being pretty aggressive and it certainly is going to perceive themselves as being more dominant and a yearling bull that's uh, fresh introduced to that group. That's a good recipe for uh, for having some injuries. So I discourage you from co-mingling those age classes. And then just as the breeding season progresses, monitor for signs of lameness, monitor for injury, monitor for disease in those bulls. Um, don't necessarily be terribly concerned if you don't see bulls trailing females or mounting females because some bulls are, are shy breeders and a lot of British breeds, for example, for whatever reason, have that behavior. But if you're continuing to see heat activity as that breeding season progresses, 
that could be cause for concern. So that's really what you need to be monitoring is the female on female mounting behavior that you're seeing as that breeding season progresses. And so if you continue to see a lot of heat activity late into the breeding season, um, that's cause for concern. I always encourage you to go out and just spend a little time observing those animals in, in the morning or in the evening. That's really the best time to watch for heats anyway. And, and this rule of thumb I have, um, if all the cows in a group are cycling, because the estrus cycle is about 21 days long, you would expect to see about 5% of the group in heat every day if cows are not pregnant. So, so for example, let's say you have 100 cows and late in the breeding season, you're going out and you're seeing five cows in heat pretty consistently each day, uh, that, that may be some cause for concern, right? Um, and then also remember some young bulls do fall in love. So, so be mindful of that. If, if you see some of that behavior, you, you very well could have um, that as a, as a cause for why some of that happens. I put that in there partly because it's Valentine's Day next week. So I thought I should mention it. But uh, with that, I'm gonna stop and, and take any questions. So uh, any questions on bull management?